I'd like to welcome everybody back to the workshop. We're going to start off this next session with two members of the standing committee, um, Dr. Susan Harper and Dr. Bob Sykes. And that's going to be followed by Dr. Kate Storves, who's going to also speak uh, relative to the uh, Vic Ross survey. So we're going to begin this session with Dr. Susan Harper. Susan, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so for the next session, Bob and I were tasked with providing a high-level summary of the feedback that we received from various stakeholders over the past two and a half years. And uh, this required us to go back and review transcripts and records and um, attempt to tease out the prevailing comments and concerns that emerged, which ultimately became the outline for this workshop. I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Susan Harper. I am a veterinarian and I work in the Office of Animal Care and Use at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And I'm joined by Dr. Robert Sykes. Uh, Bob, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Susan. Bob Sykes. I am Professor Emeritus at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, where I was an evolutionary and behavioral ecologist. Um, typically, I introduce myself as a dirty boots field biologist. That is my background, and, and that is the way I have kind of gotten into this animal um, oversight. So we're tasked with providing this high-level level overview of what occurred in our listening sessions. Um, and we're going to start off at about the 60,000 foot range. So if we could go to the first slide, please. Thank you. Um, during the course of these 26 listening sessions, one thing became very clear, and that is the need for the guide. In no session was it indicated that the guide has outlived its usefulness, that it, it's no longer needed. It's clear that this is a fundamental foundation document for IACUX and for animal users. So that was not the question. Really, the question became um, that since it is this, this organizational uh, framework, and it's essential to uh, using this, then what really were the questions and challenges that we needed to bring forth to the consensus study, as Dr. Fox has just uh, mentioned? Um, when we went through all these 26 listening sessions and we, we went through the comments, in no case for any of these challenges was there a common theme, a common um, solution that was never presented for any of these challenges, but the same challenges keep coming up over and over, virtually every listening session. So the fact that these came up so repeatedly makes it clear that these are things that have to be discussed by the consensus committee, just as they were discussed by um, the consensus committee for the prior edition, as Janet Garber has illustrated. These are questions that remain so as Dr. Fox said, we are back to the future. Um, we're, we're reliving this. So as we go through, as we went through these challenges, it became clear to the committee that the, the responses that we were getting, we were asking very different questions or, or different questions than what we're presenting here. But uh, Susan and I have coalesced these into the central guiding challenges for this workshop. And these challenges are really what we're going to focus on. But before we focus on those challenges, you need a little bit more background about the standing committee, uh, about the uh, work, the listening sessions themselves. So if I could have the next slide. First off, there tended to be a bias towards veterinary representation in these listening sessions, which is totally expected because the veterinarians are the ones that are tasked with implementing the guide. But relative to the, the number of individuals that work with the guide and that are impacted by the guide, the group that was probably underrepresented, certainly in most of the sessions, were the researchers, the boots on the ground researchers that are always impacted by the guide. So if we could go back and recreate and perhaps gather more information, the researchers would be a group that we would want to uh, focus on. And it's important to realize this, this bit of bias because that influences how uh, these um, challenges are framed. If I could have the next slide. 
So the challenges that were identified during these listening sessions, and each of these is going to be a topic in this presentation. Susan and I will go through tag teaming on these. Um, and uh, the, the basic challenges were the regulatory aspects of the guide. And I'm gonna cover this one in just a mo uh, bit more detail in just a moment. How the guide is used by various individuals, by various organizations. In other words, what is the, the task of the oversight committee relative to the use of that guide? As Dr. Garber mentioned, performance and engineering standards. Absolutely, that kept coming up repeatedly. As did key topics in housing uh, and husbandry, particularly for the typical um, laboratory type animals. What are the global implications of the guide? What are emerging issues of the guide that the consensus com committee needs to wrestle with? And issues regarding the format of the guide, basically how this information is packaged within the guide, especially when we start rolling in um, accessory resources. And then finally, how we're going to manage programs of the future. So these are the challenges that uh, our, this workshop is built around and that the, the consensus committee will need to wrestle with. If I could go forward to the next slide. As we go through these challenges, it's important to realize that there are gaps but that were perceived between uh, organizations and the perspectives presented in these listening sessions. And they tended to be broken out along these um, three divisions. Whether the institution was a small in, uh, institution that had limited internal resources or a large institution that had vast and complex research projects, lots of, uh, of uh, uh, institutional resources to draw upon, but they had unique challenges that were associated with the composition of their particular programs. Or whether the listening session was composed primarily of individuals from industry where there were pressures such as, as competing regulatory requirements that may be associated with the guide, but may also be dependent on uh, international standards. And harmonizing the um, um, regulation of their use of animals across these diverse frameworks. So this is kind of the, the broad level overview um, and how we have, have crafted these challenges. But it also comes with some challenges in terms of, of figuring out how IACUCs are using this diverse bit of information. For that, I'm going to turn it back to Susan. Susan? Okay, the next slide, please. Another interesting observation that came up during the listening sessions is that it seems like the IACUCs' roles and responsibilities are expanding significantly over time. And many of the participants felt that the committee is being asked to do um, a tackle a growing list of issues that are often quite complex. In addition to ensuring the humane care and use of animals in science, the IACUC has also become the default gatekeeper for a variety of secondary issues that we all agree are important to good science, but frequently exceed the skills and expertise of committee members. And these include things like experimental design, training of research staff, scientific merit, st statistical rigor, general safety, occupational safety and health, and even facility security concerns. Over, the over time, the expansion of these duties has placed a significant burden on committees, particularly those at small and medium-sized institutions, as Bob just referenced. Next slide. The next slides I'm about to show illustrate three distinct ways that we heard a lot of committees have evolved and tend to function. In our first diagram, each of the various disciplines and subject matter experts that have a part in animal studies provide information to the Animal Care and Use Committee. There is little or um, no other exchange of ideas between these disciplines and the committee. Instead, the committee collects, collates, and analyzes the information that it receives from these various sources and ultimately determines the best course of action that will ensure that scientific objectives and methods are properly aligned with the humane care and use of animals. Next slide. So this slide shows a similar process, except in this case, instead of simply providing the committee with information that it's expected to evaluate in a vacuum, 
Each of the various disciplines and subject matter experts interacts with the committee in a collaborative or consultative manner. In this model, the committee forms independent partnerships with all these different disciplines and applies this information it receives to address a shared objective. In other words, each discipline cooperates with the committee to solve a common goal, but there is still minimal cross interactions or synergy with other disciplines to guide the outcome. Next slide. And our third slide illustrates an alternate approach in which the various disciplines and subject matter experts consult and collaborate independently be before they present their combined coordinated recommendations to the Animal Care and Use Committee. In this model, the IACUC receives a compilation of the collective comments and feedback provided by these external groups and experts. However, the process may or may not lead to effective dialogue between the committee and all of the stakeholders that are involved. Next slide. During our listening sessions, we heard about another potential option that allows more uniform participation by various parties who have a vested interest in the outcome of an animal study. In this model, the IACUC, subject matter experts, and research team members participate and contribute equally to the outcome, which allows the workload to be shared and more evenly distributed among all stakeholders. We've depicted this relationship as a Venn diagram made up of three matching circles to show that the researchers, IACUC, and subject matter experts are all equal partners in this endeavor. Every component has a distinct and separate function in the process. However, the circles also overlap to some degree, demonstrating that their various roles and responsibilities are not always distinct and may coalesce in some cases. The center where all three circles intersect represents the single shared goal, and that is the welfare of animals that are used in science. Next slide. And this slide shows how the broad range of responsibilities, which were all delegated to the Animal Care and Use Committee in an earlier slide, can be more evenly distributed by reassigning functions to the other partners. This approach should help to compensate for any perceived gaps in the overall process and hopefully leads to a more balanced and sustainable governance system. Thanks, Susan. So how we push the boundaries of these circles in the Venn diagram really makes a difference. And how those circles are pushed um, really depends on the individual perspective. With that, we're going to go to the next slide. So this is going to be the first topic um, that we're going to have in, in uh, the sessions throughout these next two days. Um, and this general challenge was really built around using the guide for regulatory purposes. Okay, and you can put regulatory here in quotes if you like, because there is is disagreement and there was um, confusion, frankly, about whether it is in fact a regulatory document or not. Um, when we went through the the data from the listening sessions, the topics that came up and the number of times that these topics were brought up is listed below. Defining terminology specifically, should, must and may. This came up at the top spot 109 times, as Dr. Garber has uh, relayed. Implementation of the guide, how the guide is implemented, um, in effect, how the, uh, the IACUC deals with its responsibilities and which responsibilities fall under the IACUC, second place. And then the guide as a regulatory instrument, so teasing out this question of whether or not it is uh, regulation or not um, in the, the third spot. So let's go to the next slide and dig down a little bit. Specific challenges of using the guide for regulatory purposes. It became pretty clear across all of these 26 listening sessions that the guide was in fact viewed as a de facto regulatory. This means that because it is de facto regulatory, harmonizing with existing statutes and regulations and articulating with the other uh, guidance resources is going to be essential for the consensus committee to consider. If, on the other hand, the guide is emphatically not regulatory, if it is not required 
then that needs to be stated explicitly up front and everyone guided on the uh, uh, the interaction with that document. But again, throughout all of throughout most of these listening sessions, the overriding view was that they're viewing it as quasi-regulatory, de facto regulatory. Because that is the prevailing view and because that is the way users experience the guide, clarity is crucial, especially when distinguishing between mandatory requirements and optional practices. In other words, between must, should, or may. The clarity of those terms has got to be precise and their use has got to be consistent throughout the entire document. And this is this is nothing new. As Dr. Garber mentioned, this is something that was an overwhelmed, overriding concern in the last revision as well. But there was also concern regarding use of those terms because there was a tendency for should statements to evolve into expectations. So precisely what defines a, a uh, requirement, a must, has got to be distinct from what it is involved in an alternative approach or best practices, and when it must, when it it is um, confused with with uh, must, then that's where the um, IACUCs wrestle with application. Since it is viewed and typically used as regulatory, IACUCs are often unwilling to employ the flexibility to appropriately address the needs of specific programs. Since the, the, the guide is used across so many different platforms, across so many different size institutions, and across so many different focal points, there's got to be flexibility. There is no way a single document could address all of those possibilities, at least not in, in great detail. And the IACUCs have got to be able to employ the, that flexibility. And that needs to be uh, very clear in the document. We all know that PHS policy incorporates the guide by reference, but that's it doesn't stop there. Current regulations and policies extend beyond the guide to include PHS policy, the annual welfare regs, ALAC standards, and others. And when you step outside of the country, now you're talking about international regulations that come into play as well. So how the guide articulates with all of these other um, regulatory documents that are absolutely regulatory is really important. And since the guide is in fact viewed as a de facto regulatory instrument, there is uncertainty as to the scope of the responsibility of the IACO, as Susan has just gone over. What falls under the purview of the IACUC and what falls outside of their purview, how different institutions solve those problems is variable. And the guide can and should give some information about how these different approach, these different um, responsibilities can be met while simultaneously reducing regulatory burden. So this is the first challenge. Um, whether or not it is, is uh, regulatory explicitly or not, um, certainly it is viewed that way. Susan, back to you for the next slide. Okay. So our next major topic pertains to challenges with how information in the guide is used or applied. And there were four predominant themes that we identified during these discussions, and these centered around the review process and specifically responsibilities for scientific merit review, experimental design, and consideration of the three R's, which stand for replacement, refinement, and reduction. Next slide. There was universal agreement that the IACUC's primary purpose is to ensure the humane care and treatment of animals, and furthermore, that this responsibility must be the committee's top priority. However, it was also acknowledged that the committee has taken on more and more responsibilities over the years, and the committee's expanding role has led to some confusion and frustration. 
Many participants question whether committees are appropriately constituted to function as the default gatekeeper for other issues that certainly influence how animal studies are conducted, but often fall outside the committee's skill set and regulatory mandate. There was common agreement that the guide does not provide sufficient detail on some of these topics and that most committees are not prepared or properly trained to take on these responsibilities, which include monitoring general safety issues, statistical analysis, and scientific merit. It was noted that tasking the IACUC with oversight of occupational health has been particularly awkward since the committee is limited in its ability to assess risks and provide general health and safety recommendations to individuals who work with animals. There was widespread support for IACUCs to acknowledge their own limitations and expand the use of ad hoc consultants to compensate for areas where members lack expertise and also to maintain collaborative relationships with researchers who may often be the only accessible authority for certain areas of research. Many participants agreed that both of these options should be emphasized as resources in the next version of the guide. Many also felt that the guide should offer committees more latitude and flexibility for the oversight of research activities that are highly unique or complex and that do not completely align with a standard review process. And some examples of these were exploratory studies, case studies, and teaching protocols. And it was felt that committees also need flexibility when applying the three Rs. For some studies, such as those evaluating the biodiversity of a population or a species, the goal is to collect and obtain as many samples as possible. And in other studies, surplus animals or sometimes non-target species can be inadvertently caught due to the imprecise nature of capture methods that you're using. And both of these examples contradict the principles of reduction, but are still scientifically valid. Participants recommended that committees aim for consistency in terms of the basic forms that are adopted, the specific terminology or language that's used, and with common procedures such as intervals and the focus of reviews. Many found it challenging and frustrating that review intervals do not always coincide with funding cycles. And finally, there was substantial support to explore a more efficient and possibly tiered review process that focuses on levels of risk similar to the procedures that are used by institutional review boards or IRBs for human studies. Next slide. Okay, this is back to um, one of the challenges that I'm responsible for, performance versus engineering standards. Wow, talk about a hot topic. Yes, this came up repeatedly as again, Dr. Uh, Garber wrestled with um, in the previous revision. The overall take, I think across all listening sessions, I think everyone on the standing committee would agree that the performance standard approach is critical, that maintaining that, is uh, especially important, but that was not a 100% view. There were some proponents of maintaining engineering standards because they're black and white. They're easy to apply, um, and it takes all of the guesswork out for the IACUC. So if we can go to some of the specific challenges on the next slide. Performance standards are important because they can be used to target and to highlight and to really fit the application of the guide to the specific program's unique focus, whether it is limitations that the, the program has in terms of, of resource availability, if they've got something that's, that will work in another way, that's fine. Um, so being able to tailor to institutional uh, needs is important. But gosh, those engineering standards are so much easier to apply. So where is the trade-off here? Overall, there was a sense among the listening sessions that there needed to be more emphasis placed on local authority, the IACUCs, to devise performance standards, but – and these performance standards were, were to meet their local needs – but there needed to be more guidance about how to devise those performance standards. So examples within the guide would be a critical um, addition. Expanding how a, a unit could go about creating performance standards or additional resources that they could tap into um, for establishing those performance standards. 
There was a very strong preference across all guides for the guide to be written with flexibility and not be overly prescript prescriptive. In other words, the, the take home overall was to stick with performance standards and the flexi flexibility they entail, but that comes at a price. It comes at a price because now the responsibility for um, the clarity rest with the Animal Oversight Committee, the IACA. They have to make sure that the, the uh, structure that they're creating to erect those performance standards, performance standards is meeting the needs and meeting the, re the uh, requirements of the guide. This is not a one-size-fits-all approach. It needs to be tailored to the institution. And this is where the institutional size and resources becomes really critical. Performance standards that have to be uh, developed by an institution may be easily done at large institutions with lots of resources. But at small institutions, this becomes a real limitation. And the ability for those small institutions to reach out for additional guidance, whether it's, it's uh, from another organization or from other individuals that have, have experienced these challenges with that uh, species or with that um, method of housing, whatever, that has to be um, part of the process. So the flexibility. Susan, we'll go back to you for the next one. Okay. So the next major area of discussion focused on animal housing and husbandry. And three subtopics emerged during these discussions that include uh, the general environment, housing and management of animals, animal welfare and well-being, and social housing. Next slide. Discussions of animal environments, care and housing closely fall well, the content in chapter three of the current guide and um, many of the listening sessions with veterinary professional societies seem to yield the most substantive and insightful comments, but we did identify a few overarching themes. Most participants felt a review of standards used to define the operating parameters from facilities such as ventilation, humidity control, HVAC system performance and other aspects of an animal's environment should be prioritized, particularly where scientific evidence is deficient. Standards should be based on data that clearly demonstrates a positive effect on animal health and welfare, and it should also consider the impact of new equipment and technologies that complement or enhance facility engineering systems, such as individually ventilated caging units. The mounting pressure for institutions to incorporate green management principles must be acknowledged and programs should have the latitude to comply with new environmental mandates that are on the horizon. Any revisions that are made must be implemented in a phased and deliberate manner that ensures a smooth and efficient transition, particularly when significant money and time are involved to make these changes. Ideally, housing options should align with an animal's species, natural behaviors, life stage, and enrichment preferences. Any changes in size or design should be based on relevant literature and scientific evidence that clearly show a net gain in animal comfort or welfare, and implementation should be approached judiciously due to the considerable costs that are often involved. Flexibilities with sanitation practices and intervals should also be an option, depending on the equipment and substrates that are used and the housing density, developmental stage, and physiologic condition of the animals that are housed. Next slide. There was broad recognition that certain animals or populations of animals have unique or special husbandry needs, such as those with immune dyscrasias, and local authorities must have some flexibility to accommodate their special requirements. There was also general support for the adoption of low stress or non-aversive handling and research methods, such as using the tube method to transfer rodents between cages and decreasing reliance on practices that restrict consumption of water or food. Some participants expressed an interest in having access to more guidance either in the guide or through other reputable sources on how to safely transport animals, 
the housing and care of novel species that are becoming more common, such as ferrets and swine, and information on the management of non-human primate breeding colonies and nurseries, as well as criteria for assessing sanctuaries for the housing and care of retired animals. Participants also felt overly general recommendations for housing aquatic species should be avoided due to the diversity of species that are found and the life, special life st stage requirements that must be met for various types. The benefits of social housing were also discussed and contrasted with notable challenges that are encountered when attempting to pair or group house species that are either not highly social or individual animals that are not highly compatible. Many felt broad recommendations or requirements should not be uniformly applied and that these types of decisions are best managed at the local level. Most agreed that the next version of the guide should clearly acknowledge potential risks and increased oversight responsibilities that apply when certain animals are socially housed. Next slide. Okay, this brings us to global implications of the guide. Um, and this is something that uh, we received 30 comments on, some of them very detailed. If I could go to the next slide. That the, glide has, that the guide has global implications is not surprising. Um, it is uh, a document that has been available for a long time, and many parts of the world have no additional guidance um, of their own, so they are resorting to the use of the guide as a template when they build their own documents, or they default to the guide. Because of the global, global implications of the guide, it's especially critical for the next version of the guide to be able to articulate with other global standards and expectations, um, whether it be uh, laboratory-based or whether it be the laws and regulations of whatever country uh, and researchers happen to be working in. So recognition that the, the framework of the guide has got to articulate with local laws, local regulations, and international expectations uh, winds up being critical. The guide, because it is recognized as one of the three standards for accreditation by ALAC International, brings an additional high profile to this document. Because it is one of those three standards, it is one that is very commonly used. That means that uh, a country or an institution that has no accreditation at any point is going to be looking at the guide as they fashion their um, accreditation documents if they're applying for ALAC accreditation. If they are developing their own guidance documents, the guide becomes that template. There are, without question, many countries that do not have requirements for um, use of animals in research, in their, their uh, higher education programs or, or research programs. And the guide becomes very often the default document. Challenges arise when there is non-congruence between the guide and these other guidance requirements. So how the guide articulates, not necessarily completely harmonizing, but how it articulates with these other requirements is critical. And that's gonna be a challenge for the next uh, consensus committee. It's going to require very broad interpretation. And it's not just of the guide. We've got to recognize that it's not just the guide that is used as resources for these um, other countries. It's the accessory documents, the accessory guidance documents. And this is going to come up in a session a little bit later. So this will be emphasized again. Susan, back to you. Okay, next slide. Participants recognize that the types and varieties of animals used to the service continuously increase, especially when field studies that involve wildlife. I'm sorry. Um, 
And there is a growing need to provide reputable sources of information to address the care and use of these species. However, many felt adding all or even part of this information to the existing guide would be an overwhelming task. A more practical option might be to simply reference other guidelines or guidance documents that have been developed by knowledgeable experts who have experience working with these species. This would keep the scope of the next guide similar to that of the current version, or the content could be further limited to address only those universal responsibilities and requirements that are common to all programs. An effort of this nature would require significant coordination across various dip disciplines and groups to accomplish, but would also result in a more expansive network of information sources and valuable references available to the research community. Discussions on education emphasize the need for tactical expansion of training programs to address several critical needs, such as raising public awareness and support for the use of animals in science, educating individuals who use the guide on an occasional or less frequent basis, and mentoring IACUC members and program staff who are struggling to define and validate performance standards that are appropriate for their own institution's needs. Most participants agree that teaching IACUC members to strategically apply the core principles articulated in the guide would raise their awareness of self-imposed regulatory burden which is often based on arbitrary standards that have minimal impact on the quality of animal care and welfare. Next slide. Okay, format of the guide. Um, whether the guide should be crafted as some, some type of living document, received 68 comments, and how the guide incorporated other guides or guidelines or guidance documents. In other words, accessory resources uh, received 66 comments. Okay, if I can go to the next slide. A little bit of background here. Remember that from earlier this morning, the goal really is to approach this revision of the guide or, or this next version of the guide as a guide to the use of animals in research. Basically, it's drop the word laboratory uh, from the title so that it, it is, becomes broadly applicable. Well, when you do that, now, instead of focusing on typical laboratory animals, which, what, perhaps two dozen species, now you're talking about 70,000 species of vertebrates or more, if we go to a point where we're including things such as cephalopods. So there are accessory resources. There are um, additional guidance documents that were developed to fit this, this gap between uh, what IACUX had as a resource from the original versions of the guide and how we um, apply that guide to these other taxa. So the question then becomes, how are these resources incorporated within the guide? At present, some of them are cited in um, the text. Some of them are simply added as uh, resources in the appendices, and some of them, such as the guide for euthanasia, is deeply incorporated throughout the guide. So all of these are accessory resources. The question becomes, how are they incorporated? And I'm going to I'm going to take this one out of order, incorporating the uh, other guidance documents first, and then come back to a living document, because I think that sequence actually makes more sense, even though uh, incorporating the, the guidance documents received slightly fewer comments. So um, there was strong feeling that uh, these accessory guidance documents needed to be referenced um, in the text of the guide as a resource. Um, and uh, that these guidance documents were developed specifically to fit these uh, vacancies in the guide as it was crafted. Um, the question, if we're incorporating these, though, some of the other questions come up are, how do we ensure that those supplemental documents are kept current? Especially if we're thinking about moving towards a living document format with the guide. If we're incorporating these accessory documents, how do we make sure that they uh, have that same level of currency? How about the, the uh, peer uh, review of these accessory documents? 
we have different formats of peer review. And by accessory documents, let me be clear what I'm talking about. I'm talking about accessory documents that detail specific methods such as euthanasia or that are specific to different species of animals such as the various taxon uh, specific guidelines for wild mammals, uh, uh, wild birds, etc. used in research or the Ag Guide. And these very different documents were created by scientific organizations and they went through different levels of review because they're the product of that professional organization. If we're incorporating them deeply within the guide as a resource that we expect IACUCs to employ, should there be some level of standardization for review? And if so, how do we go about that for documents that, that we don't own? Um, the question arose that uh, how should these uh, supplemental or accessory documents be viewed by the IACUC? If the IACUC, uh, uh, if the guide is viewed as de facto regulatory, does that make these accessory documents that are referenced within the guide de facto regulatory? That's a difficult question to address. If specifics for diverse tax are, are incorporated into the guide by reference, then should the specifics for laboratory animals be handled the same way? In other words, should we have a guide that really lays out uh, philosophical approaches and then an additional supplementary resource when we get into the details of the various types of laboratory animals as we do for the um, uh, wild animals or for ag animals or should we expand the guide so that it includes sections for all of these diverse taxa, which seems like a pretty unreasonable task? Now, let me go back to the question of the guide as a living document. Um, there was a, a lot of enthusiasm for this because we realized that the, the um, update times for the guide have gotten longer and the updates have gotten larger. But if we're going to incorporate all of these other diverse animals, that's going to make that even more unwieldy. Further, especially if we're still putting forth some, some uh, engineering standards and there are changes made in those, then that puts the um, institutions that are impacted by those changes on a very short leash in terms of, of how those changes are implemented within their, their organization. So the, the utility of the guide as a living document was realized that we can keep current with science, but the practicality of making wholesale changes becomes difficult. And that depends on institutional resources. Smaller institutions may have a much more difficult time with some of those uh, imperative changes than larger institutions. So how we go about um, making sure that the guide is kept current in whatever format of the guide comes next is really critical. And this, frankly, is where the work of the standing committee is going to be uh, very important over the coming years to think about how those changes are incorporated as we move forward. So the format of the guide really depends on, on how it is used by each institution. And with that, um, back to you, Susan, for programs of the future. Okay. The next step. Our next slide. So this brings us to our last session for the workshop that's going to focus on managing animal programs of the future. And the topics covered in this session represent insights and observations that came up during the various listening sessions and primarily focus on emphasizing ways to better manage energy demands and the importance of novel technologies and methods that are continuously evolving. Although uh, specific technologies were referenced, most of the focus was on how to facilitate their adoption without being overly prescriptive or disruptive. The next slide. So during these discussions, another set of three R's came up, 
um, when we were talking about better energy management and sustainability. And this time the R's represented reducing energy requirements while promoting reusing and recycling materials. So conservation was consistently regarded as an important and an achievable goal that should not interfere with the quality and integrity of the research being performed. But there um, were no specific suggestions on how to go about that just yet. There were also widespread recognition that technology is evolving at an increasingly rapid pace and the basis for adopting or requiring new equipment should always be founded on good science. A systematic validation process that allows for stakeholder feedback is critical to this process and implementation should provide a phased and del deliberate pathway that allows for a smooth and efficient transition. And so with that, I think we have concluded our remarks, but before I close, I'll ask Bob, do you have any additional comments? Really my only, uh, the last comment I have is that what we were tasked with here is provide a very broad level overview of what we heard in the listening sessions and how it has shaped um, the questions and the challenges that the standing committee views moving forward. Over the next sessions, you're going to hear details of each of these sessions. We're going to pull out each of these challenges and move into each of those in detail. And for each of those challenges, we've identified specific, we've identified speakers and uh, th that are going to address details from different perspectives. And that's the important part. These are challenges because they were viewed um, by diverse groups as, as having different potential solutions. And because we all use the guide very differently to tailor to our programs, those different approaches are critical. So we've tried to identify speakers and solicit speakers to provide some diversity in those opinions. I think it's going to be an interesting uh, next couple of days. Bob, Susan, thank you very much for those talks. Um, uh, a few questions have come in uh, that sort of remind me um, that we're not covering everything um, today in the workshop sessions, that we've gone through 26 listening sessions. Um, there were many, many comments made by very many people. Not everything's represented in these sessions. And um, do you or Susan have any comments about um, some of the things we heard like harm benefit analysis, uh, ethics, areas where there was controversy and that there will be some topical areas that the consensus committee will have to consider for what goes into the next revision of the guide? Great question, um, great observation. And the answer is yes. And some of those very topics will come up in some of the next sessions. So yes, th this these were topics that were uh, focused on. Um, what we tried to do in this high level overview was identify the basic core challenges. And then many of the uh, items that you mentioned are going to fit in under some of those core challenges. So we did not, we, we tried very deliberately not to get down into the weeds um, and, and get with every uh, uh, detail, every uh, comment that was made, but to provide kind of a consensus view, not, not a consensus, but a, a, a very broad view. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker, Dr. Kate Storves, um, is going to uh, present an overview really of the veterinary profession, I would say. It's uh, a group, the Veterinary Consortium for Research Animal Welfare, that consists of the major groups that um, serve the, the veterinary profession that serves research animals. And as Bob said earlier, um, veterinarians have been highly instrumental in comments regarding uh, revising the guide because they're often at the interface of the people that actually work with the guide. So we as a standing committee felt that it was extremely important to hear extensively from this group. They've done a lot of work and to incorporate uh, some of their findings into some of our considerations. So for that reason, we're going to have them present uh, results of their survey um, at this workshop. So with that, I'll let 
Kate introduce herself and the organization and take it away. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and thank you to the committee for inviting me today to share the revision result, uh, revision priority survey results from the VCRA CW group. Um, I'm Kate Storvis. I'm a clinical veterinarian at Intuitive Surgical located just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Today, I'm presenting as a member of the Veterinary Consortium for Research, Animal Care, and Welfare. Um, and so before I um, jump into the survey that we conducted, I wanted to give a quick introduction of who we are as the consortium. Um, so next slide, slide, please. We essentially sprang forth from some ideas and discussion and began officially meeting in 2019. We are a, a group composed of members from four of the large animal science societies, so ACLAM, ASLAP, ALAS, and APV. Um, we also have a neighbor liaison, Dr. Taylor Bennett, um, on the consortium, as well as an additional ACLAM liaison that sits with us. I personally am one of the two ALAS representatives. And overall, our mission was, is, and still is, to provide accurate information about the care and use of research animals to inform the public, lawmakers, and the scientific community about veterinary care and welfare of these animals. And essentially we knew that it was coming up on time for the guide to be revised. And because of that, we decided to focus our resources on conducting a survey. And what we wanted to do was um, conduct a survey for our four stakeholder groups uh, get an idea of how everyone would prioritize revising the guide if they were in charge of this mission, um, and then present that to the laboratory animal community. So um, next slide, please. I'm going to go through today our initial survey that was conducted in 2022, um, go through those results, and then we'll talk about a couple of supplemental surveys that we ran as well. So next slide, please. The, the um, initial survey objectives, and um, apologies, I have a lot of animations, so thank you. Um, uh, was Our goal was to identify our stakeholder priorities. We wanted to reach out to all four of our um, priority groups and be able to break that out by organization, but also by role. Um, so we asked folks who completed the survey to identify what organization they were from, what their primary role at their facility was, and we were hoping that ultimately we would be able to identify any knowledge gaps or additional resources and new references for a new version of the guide. And to get at that information, we also asked some open field text questions that um, I'll talk about as well. And ultimately wanted to provide that data uh, and our, our analysis of it to the lab animal community. So our initial survey ran for 71 days of data collection. We had 664 individuals start the survey. And if you um, were one of those that completed the survey, you know that it was a big time commitment. Uh, we tried to preface that so that you were prepared. You were sat down with your favorite beverage and your guide and got ready to, to really get into it. So 664 individuals started the survey. 179 of those took it all the way through completion. Um, and I wanted to just put up your responses by organization. I mentioned we asked everyone to identify what organization they were um, a participant in, and you could select multiple. So that's why the, the uh, organization totals don't add up to 179. Um, but essentially, this was the breakdown. We did have 17 individuals that replied that they were not a member of any of our four stakeholder organizations. And it could be that um, they were forwarded the survey from an iCook representative, a colleague, but they weren't one of our um, four stakeholder organ organization members. Um, we were also able to reach out to some of the scientific communities to pass the survey on um, via email to some of our uh, research users. So moving on to um, the roles that our respondents um, chose. Again, um, it's been mentioned previously how, um, how important the veterinarians have been in this process. And we once again had an overwhelming uh, majority of veterinarians or 40% here, 32% click program director, 16% uh, were compliance professionals. We did have that 7% of the research community here. 
Operations and facility managers were 2% of our responses. And then in the other category, we had 3%. And we did ask folks to um, enter into a free text box what, the, what their job role was if they selected others. So just as some examples, we had um, consultant, training manager, uh, compassion fatigue professional, associate director, director, toxicologic pathologist. So that's some of the examples of what the other category represented for our survey. Um, so moving on, the very first question, besides identifying what um, organization you were in and what your role was, was we asked everyone to rank the chapters of the guide. So if you had to start somewhere, what was the number one place that you would start? And what we did was assign weighted um, points to each vote. So if chap a chapter got a vote for most in need, it got five points and so on. Uh, we added up all of those points and that basically gave us the total and that was the way that we ranked chapters. So spoiler alert here, chapter three, uh, which was environment, housing, and management, one for the most in need of revision, and it had 709 points. Um, next slide, please. So this is a review of the most in need, second most, third most, fourth most vote totals with the weighted totals in the final column to the right. And overwhelmingly so, we would say chapter three, the environment, housing, and management chapter was most in need of revision, 709 points total. Uh, in a distant second, the animal care and use program. And then you'll see chapter four and chapter five were very close, almost interchangeable. Chapter one needs the least amount of attention. It's the smallest chapter. Um, so it got 287 points total. So if you only had time or the ability to focus on one chapter, chapter three is where to start. So moving forward, we asked everyone to then rank the sections within the chapters. If you're familiar with your guide, as I'm sure all of us on this, on this workshop are, you know that the chapters have sections within them. And we asked individuals to vote again on the top three sections, most in need of revision within each chapter. And so we awaited totals again, added points. And in this example, chapter three, terrestrial housing section had the most votes. So 238 points there. Um, when we look at everything ranked together, chapter three had four out of the five sections in the top five needing attention. Terrestrial housing being the first, I would call that an overwhelming first again, 238 points. Um, terrestrial environment was the second. Terrestrial management was the third. The role of the IACUC from chapter two snuck in there at, at fourth, and then aquatic housing in fifth. So this is overall the top five sections that our survey responders would focus on for making revisions to the guide. Next slide, please. Again, if you are familiar with the guide, then you know that chapters three, four, and five also have topics highlighted. And so what we wanted to do was ask respondents to se select any topics that they required revision. We didn't ask folks to rank them. We just said, pick however many you think need revision. And what we did was went back and ranked them ourselves. And so this next slide says the top 10 topics uh, that needed to be addressed. And I don't think anyone is gonna be surprised that terrestrial housing, the primary enclosure got the most votes for the topic that needs revision first. Um, terrestrial housing and viral enrichment was very close at 68 votes. Terrestrial management, behavior, and social management came in at 60. Um, it's interesting to note that nine out of the 10 topics came from chapter three. We had one that snuck in with construction guidelines and HVAC specifically um, came from chapter five. And I think we're all very familiar with the challenges that come with managing HVAC systems in our facilities. So that's not, not a surprise there. But overall, chapter three wins again, um, specifically terrestrial housing, terrestrial management, and terrestrial en environment taking up that top five there. So for the next part of our survey, we had two open-ended questions that we asked our respondents. Um, and they're listed here. We wanted each of one of our respondents to go through the chapters 
and tell us the key issues that they wanted to be addressed. Um, if they wanted to tell us the page number, we would love that. If they had any additional publications or up-to-date references, we asked for those as well. That was our first question. The second question was essentially what's missing. What new sections or topics would you like to be addressed in the next version of the guide? Um, and so anyone who has ever done a, a data analysis for a survey knows that when you open a text box for respondents to fill in, it makes analyzing the data very difficult. Um, essentially, what we decided to do was to theme up all of the open-ended question responses. And so that's how I'm going to present those to you today. So you can go to the next slide for me. Um, so these are overall how many responses we got for key issues that needed to be addressed in each chapter. Um, again, it's not a surprise that chapter three, we had 199 open-ended responses specific to chapter three. Um, overall, we got 531 open-ended comments, which was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I can't underscore enough how much information we got from these open-ended responses and how much time it was clear individuals devoted to um, telling us exactly what they felt needed to be revised in the guide. So I'm gonna go through each one of these chapters as well as the, um, the new topics that were called out and talk briefly about them. So next slide, please. So chapter one, again, it's the shortest chapter. We still got 26 open-ended responses related to this chapter. I did want to specifically call out that nine of those were specific to the use of must, should, or may. Um, and that's something that we, we used for, to develop our supplemental survey. I also wanted to call out um, that the harm benefit analysis topic, the three R's and ethics were commented on eight times here. So very close second with the must, should, or may. If we had, uh, responses that were one-offs didn't have in common with any other response, then we categorize those as miscellaneous. So you will see a miscellaneous bar for each one of the chapters as well. So we'll go to chapter two next. This was the animal care and use program. We had 76 open-ended responses related specifically to key issues in this chapter that our respondents felt they needed, needed to be addressed or revised. Um, overwhelmingly so, IA Cook responsibilities were called out 21 times from our respondents. Um, the need for more information about disaster planning was in second place with 16 responses. Um, and then I did want to call out here that compassion fatigue was brought up a couple of times. It shows up again later in our survey responses and was something that we followed up on um, in our supplemental surveys as well. So I wanted to call that out here. So now chapter three, again, was our, our biggest chapter, our hardest hitting chapter for open-ended responses, 199. Um, and it's it makes sense, right? It's the chapter that we that our survey respondents felt needed immediate attention. It's where you would start. Um, and I don't think it's any surprise that space requirement responses came up in first here. There were 43 responses directly related to space requirements. And I'm gonna dive down even more into that in just a minute. Um, close second was the environment um, with 44, 41 open-ended responses. Um, there were a lot of miscellaneous responses, so that was a big bar here as well. Social housing and enrichment really close in um, 21 and 22 responses. So what I wanted to spend some time doing is talking about the content of the open-ended responses here about space. So 43 of those were about space and you can move on to the next slide for me. Thank you. Um, sorry again for all of the animations, but um, so 43 of these were specific to space. I went through and pulled out some overall themes I wanted to share um, with, with the attendees of the workshop here today. And the first one that I came with that was extremely obvious by these responses was that updated references were necessary. And then again, more supporting data for the requirements. So once the requirements are given, update those references, provide supporting data. And then additional considerations for complexity of the environment. 
So virtual, uh, vertical spaces, um, addition of nesting boxes, things like that, that add complexity to the environment, not just height and width and uh, space cage requirements. Identify which species are truly social. This came up quite a bit, um, defining which species would truly benefit from social housing as opposed to defaulting for every species. And then development and use of true performance standards. So again, these are the themes that came up in these space requirement respo responses. I also wanted to break out um, some species. So there were nine responses specific to rodents requesting a, updating the sections about space requirements for these specific um, groups. So mice with litters, breeding colonies, um, paying attention to density of cages, large rats were mentioned often as well. 12 of the responses were specific to non-human primates. Again, that vertical and complexity space consideration and just more space in general. We had three related to ferrets, so wanted to call that out. Um, more data-driven recommendations are needed. There's been an increase in the use of ferrets in research, and so um, respondents really felt like this needs to be called out and attention needs to be paid for, for ferret space. Um, and then I wanted to call out as well that expanded vertical space for rabbits was mentioned several times in these responses. So just for fun, wanted to show some um, select responses related to space. So this is the raw data quotes that came from our responses. And I wanted to share these, I just um, picked these three specific responses because I think they're a really great example of the themes that were pulled out and the variety um, in the responses that we got. So. The first one, space continues to be a real issue for understanding and a real lack of any scientific performance-based studies to support current space allocations allowed. Um, the second one I'm not gonna read, but um, I really liked the would, would allow facilities to quote, animalize the environment. And then just as an example, again, of the variety, one response just had the word space. So you could go anywhere with that response. So now I'm going to move on to um, the open-ended responses directly related to the environment. Um, as a reminder, there were 41 of those, and so that's why I wanted to spend some time talking about those responses. Again, we're still in Chapter 3. We're st still in terrestrial housing. Um, in, in environment, the overall themes include revising humidity requirements based on relevant data, removing air changes per hour requirements, and then the overall consensus was that, was that temperature ranges are outdated or not supported by literature. Um, so eight comments were specific to rodents, the cold stress that they're experiencing and the need for updating their temperature ranges. 10 were specific to lighting, including advances in LED lighting, light cycles, light pollution. And six were specific to noise and vibration and the need for more guidance based on updated references. A lot of these had information about IVCs and the fact that they can contribute to noise and vibration or do they contribute to noise and vibration. If you have an IVC, then um, air changes per hour requirements need to be updated and that type of thing. Again, I pulled some select responses related to environment to share. These are raw data responses straight from the survey. Um, and again, just a really good variety of what um, individuals felt needed to be addressed. So I wanted to provide these as an example. And yep, you can go ahead and, and display those. So again, um, the specifics of our responses went all the way from mentioning specific page numbers, like page 50, second paragraph, noise, very specific, all the way down to you know, the comment that noise, none. So, um, you know, lots of lots of variability in these responses. <laughs> Pardon me. So now we're going to move on to chapter four, the key issues. And what, what I wanted to highlight here is that 17 of our 75 open-ended responses were directly related to pain and distress. Um, I think uh, the consortium and I felt that this was a reflection of the fact that veterinarians gave their their responses. Um, they were represented well here and have been in the standing committees as well. Um, and obviously pain and distress is a huge topic for all of us involved in animal research. But what's what's really incredible to see is that um, there have been so many advances in not only detecting pain and distress, 
categorizing, identifying in different species, but also treating and then refining uh, your research to eliminate or prevent pain and distress. There's so much there that's happened since our last guide um, that, that it's time to update and share all of that knowledge. So I just wanted to call that out um, as I'm a veterinarian, but also as, as a, a lot of our respondents were, um, they felt that there have been so many advances that this area ha has a great amount of information to add. Um, and then key issues for chapter five, physical plant. Um, the physical plant chapter is one that I kind of think of as a potpourri anyway. And so it was a lot of miscellaneous one-off comments about strain size or door frames and that type of thing. But noise and vibration um, also was something that came up frequently, which makes a lot of sense based on those open-ended responses we had in chapter three. Um, so just wanted to, to highlight that. Um, now, now I'd like to share the uh, themes for the new topics that were thrown out there in our open-ended responses. So 93 new topics were suggested. 16 of those were related to operations. And I will say within operations, those related to um, disaster planning, um, contingency planning, especially with the new, uh, new issue USDA requirement there. Um, several comments related to study design and how involved the IACUC should or should not be with study design. And I wanted to again draw everyone's attention to mental health. Um, it was mentioned by many respondents that mental health should be something that's discussed in the guide and that led to um, some of our supplemental survey questions. Cephalopods got a lot of, uh, got a lot of love from our open-ended responses. Seven uh, individual responses wanted to separate them out as their own group. Um, I bring up ferrets again, because they were called out several times in the space requirements. Mushet and May showed up here, which we will talk about more in supplemental survey information as well. So just a quick summary of the open-ended questions. Again, the consortium, and, I, and I've definitely felt that there was an incredible amount of value in these responses, and we were excited to provide the raw data of all of these responses to the standing committee and are hopeful that that's gonna be helpful in their, in their process moving forward. There were so many details. Um, I mentioned that some individuals called out the page number, the line number, you know, on what they felt needed to be revised. But we also got over 200 additional references, publications, um, updated studies that are not currently included in the guide that should should be considered as, as it's revised. Um, again, a couple of recurring themes just to keep in mind for uh, the mental health question about whether that should be included. And then space, space for sure, uh, was a big topic at the forefront of a lot of our responses. So of course, um, we know chapter three is an issue. Um, we got a lot of information from our open-ended responses. And we thought, what, what should we do now? So what we decided to do was um, run a couple of supplemental surveys to expand on some of the topics that came up from the initial survey. Uh, so five things we wanted just to focus on was the use of may, should, and must. What additional species should be included? Should passion fatigue, or compassion fatigue mental health be included in the guide? And then a couple of things that didn't come directly out of the survey that came up every time we had a discussion about it, which flows well into the discussions we'll have over these next two days, or what should the new guide look like? What format should it take? And essentially who should pay for it? Um, so what we did was run two additional surveys. We reached out uh, specifically to the ACLAM diplomats. Um, we wanted to get their in input on those five topics and present at forum. And then we reached out to the neighbor community. Our hope there was to get an additional response from the research community. So we utilized the red cap survey utility. We used that for, for all of our surveys, delivered via email. Um, you'll see the amount of time that we allowed for responses. And then just wanna give a, um, a shout out to the ACLAM diplomats who had 327 responses. If you recall our initial survey, we had 179. So that was a great, response number and the neighbor community, we had 138. Um, so I'm going to show responses to each um, one of our questions, but I did want to uh, let you guys know what our neighbor survey job role looked like. 
Um, we did not ask ACLAM diplomats to get into the weeds of job role, um, but we did ask the neighbor survey respondents to share with us. And it actually was an was a large amount of compliance. Um, so we all we were looking for researchers. We got compliance and research, which is great. Um, we got some more veterinary input, um, operations and facility management input, some technicians. Um, other was a was a potpourri of responses there. Um, veterinary residents. We had some non not for profit employees. We had an institutional official respond. Um, and the consultants, 3R scientists, so lots of great variety in our responses to this survey. So what I'll do is talk about each question and show a comparison of our ACLAM and neighbor group responses. Um, and the first question was, which of these terms should be used in the next edition of the guide? Interestingly enough, we had 42% and 43% respectively from ACLAM and neighbor saying no change. Um, 41% and 36% requested must and may only. Um, and then you'll see must only, may only, and new terminology. Um, a couple, uh, the new terminology was might, um, and uh, you know, a small percentage of, of folks felt just additional terminology in general. I think what we, what we gleaned from this was that should seems to be the problematic word. Um, and what's interesting is that I use the word should in almost all of these questions. So it's just a default word that we all get comfortable with using, but if you put it into a guidance document, it gets muddy. Uh, so the next question was, should specific guidance on mental health and compassion fatigue be included in the next edition of the guide? Um, interestingly enough, both the ACLAM and neighbor responses, the majority of those slides felt that no, it should not be included in the guide. Um, and, and that was honestly a surprise since it came up so often during our initial survey, we were expecting the results to be a little bit different. Um, but that was both for ACLAM and neighbor, the responses, while slight, the majority felt no. Next, the next slide, please. So we asked how, uh, what future versions of the guide should be expanded to include new or additional guidance on specific species and topics. And so we asked um, respondents to choose all that apply. So if they felt that multiple of these should be included, let us know. And ultimately we came to the conclusion that as mentioned before, a new edition of the guide is gonna be a lot longer. Um, so cephalopods, uh, 58 and 59% of our respondents felt those should be called out ind independently. Um, that additional other invertebrates should be added Wildlife species came up with 45% and 58% felt that those should be added. Um, Client-owned animals was a really interesting topic that I think um, deserves some more discussion in the future. Um, but 43% of our ACLAM community felt that should be added while 36% of neighbor. And then additional information on tertiary species. And we didn't get into the weeds on what specifically those are. Um, but 62% of ACLAM felt additional information for tertiary species and 60% for neighbor. If I had to guess, I would, I would assume that that would include ferrets. Um, and then there were some votes for none. So keep, keep the species list as it is and no additional species necessary. So the next question um, gets into the format. And so what we asked was what format should be used for the next edition of the guide. Um, and actually, the majority, both for ACLAM and neighbor, felt the current for, I'm sorry, the majority felt that the static document, but with regular defined review intervals was, was the best way to go. Our current format was next, at, or was at 15% and 12%, a hybrid document, which we defined as static, but with dynamic guidance documents in a wiki format was at 35% for both of these groups. And then an overall living document reviewed and updated continuously received the least amount of votes, 4% and 1%. So finally, we asked in these supplemental surveys, how should future revisions of the guide be funded? Um, overwhelmingly so, the, both ACLAM and neighbor surveys felt federal funding um, at 82% and 85%, um, followed by international funding at 35% and 31%. Uh, voluntary donations and mandatory user fees and other rounding out the bottom here. 
And I did want to take the opportunity to show some of the other options because we did ask anyone that selected other to provide us with open text about what they meant by other. And so these were some of the responses. Um, ultimately, a lot of these were um, still federally funded, but with caveats. So if you look at federally funded, but clarify OLA, NIH, not USDA, um, federally funded. Um, and then I, I did want to call out um, sale of photo space for equipment or various vendors, like a business card. And then um, commercial entities that wish to be accredited or assured would pay. So those are those were our other funding options. And with that, that kind of rounds out the, the survey results from the Veterinary Consortium survey. And I think we have time for questions. Thank you, Kate. Um, Kate, one question that had come up was the uh, question of the yes, no on the compassion fatigue that had the question been incorporated differently or put in a, you know, culture of care uh, type of question, would it come up as a component of that? And should it be in the guide in that fashion? Yeah, it's, it's really tough to really make an analysis when you have a yes or no question. It's very black or white. I think a lot of people responded, but wish we had given them an open text field um, so that they could then say yes, but, or no, but. Um, and so I think that's an opportunity to dive deeper to find out what individuals would be comfortable with in the guide. Um, we obviously don't want to imply that our our teams are are mentally struggling with their job, but we do want to let the the individuals know that um, we are aware it's it's a strenuous work and that compassion fatigue is real um, and, and potentially define it and provide guidance on ways to assist with that. Thank you. Um, the other thing, speaking on behalf of the workshop planning committee, I really would, and the standing committee, I think, I really would like to thank your organization for doing this. We certainly as a committee um, got a lot of help from your survey. And I think um, over the next day and a half, you'll see now that we've kind of considered what came out of that survey for helping generate some of the topic workshops at this session. Um, and particularly for areas such as, you know, future proofing the guide, considering what's the future Vivaria going to look like. We, we used the output of your survey. So I would like to thank your organization for doing this. I know it was a lot of work. Um, well, thank you. With that, I'm turn, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, uh, Dr. Lofgren, who's going to uh, update us on the rest of this meeting. Thank you. Um, I just want to give a quick recap of our morning and what we've um, covered already today. Uh, so we started off the morning with Dr. Disco, who led us through the transformation of ILAR to BOSCAR, including an expanded scope of mission and membership and the change from a council to a board. Um, he underscored that uh, animals remain to be the focal point of the organization. Dr. Garber then took us through perspectives on the eighth edition of the guide, um, bring us through the journey that started in 2005 uh, and ended with a publication in 2011, um, clarifying that the remit to that group was really not to revise, but to maintain performance standards. Um, she then took us through the need to continue to have uh, performance standards and recommends um, continued emphasis on flexibility, as well as expanding to address areas of growth that have continued in our field since 2011. Dr. Fox then uh, carried us through the work of the standing committee and a review of how the listening sessions occurred, um, highlighting problematic areas that we continue to uh, address throughout this meeting, and I'm sure in phase three, unclear terms like should, may, and must, and application of the guide, um, where we have diverse physiology and behaviors, and we just heard that again come through the VICRA survey. Um, there'll be need to be new approaches and how this is being addressed uh, for this edition of the guide as was the standing committee um, and evaluating future platforms to facilitate updates as the literature rapidly advances. There were 26 listening sessions over two and a half years, 
Uh, we're currently right now in phase two of this workshop and phase three will be the consensus committee that picks up um, this summer and carries us into the next iteration. Uh, again, 70% of the funding will need to be committed by sponsors um, of the project before that work can be initiated. We then had a fantastic review of the listening sessions and the data that was raised there by Dr. Harper and Sykes. While no common themes for a solution were found, many common challenges were identified. There was strong veterinary input um, and a need for more scientific representation. The gaps um, that were identified could be sorted by the types of institutions. And they were expanding, uh, one of the themes was expanding responsibilities of the IACUC. Um, through the digestion of those um, listening sessions, there were eight focal areas that were identified for the workshop. And we were brought through themes for each of those eight. And that's the structure going forward through the rest of the workshop is deeper dives on each of those eight areas bringing in speakers that can represent a diverse array of perspectives um, from the private sector, academia, government, and others. Um, most recently, we heard from Dr. Stills about the Vicra survey, which um, represented ALAS, ACLAM, APV, and ASLAP. Um, and through that um, work, which was identifying knowledge gaps and additional resources, they asked participants to rank uh, areas where, of the guide where they felt there was a greatest need for updates. Terrestrial housing dominated throughout, um, specifically primary enclosures, environmental enrichment, behavior, and social managing. Um, and even in the open-ended questions, terrestrial housing, um, particularly around space requirements and environment, resulted uh, in the highest area of emphasis with 200 references suggested and additional recurring themes like mental health and space requirements. Um, and I'd like to echo um, Jeff's comments that we really thank that group for doing that survey. I think the data provided has been incredibly um, helpful for giving inferences into areas that need to be in focus uh, as the um, consensus committee starts working on the next iteration of the guide. Um, we've received a number of really great questions um, that we have a couple minutes to address. Um, several of the questions raised were around um, participation in uh, the feedback that has been provided such uh, so far. So I wanted to highlight that one such way going forward that everyone can participate is by submitting references that should be considered in phase three. And there's been a link in the chat that's been placed a few times. Um, it's called Request for Feedback and Information on Updating the Guide for Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. So I'd encourage everyone to use that link to provide uh, additional feedback and specifically evidence-based literature that will guide um, changes that we should be considering. Um, I also wanted to highlight that uh, the uh, speaker slides will be presented or shared through the recordings of these sessions. So all of these sessions are going to be recorded and posted um, onto the website in about two weeks time. So you'll have access to review all of this material again. Um, so a question raised again uh, came from several audience members that did not see their perspectives included in the listening sessions of the survey, specifically um, ICUC administrators, neuroscientists, members of animal welfare groups or companies that develop new therapies for companion animals or agricultural animals. So in addition to being able to submit um, references, are there other opportunities in phase three for additional perspectives to be considered? I'm not sure if someone from the standing committee or someone from um, Bashar would like to address that. Well, I will say that the consensus, the, the, the statement of task, if, if it falls within the statement of task and is part of the plan of the consensus um, study committee for information gathering, then they may organize some uh, meetings, public meetings focused on particular topics for which those kinds of things might have input. It's a little hard to say exactly right now, but quite possibly, yes. Okay, good. So hopefully there'll be opportunities um, as are raised for additional deeper dives um, and potentially other workshops for areas that this workshop highlights or areas that we didn't get to cover here and still require uh, additional focus. Great. Um, we had some good questions around the areas of um, how are we going to keep, uh, if we do have bolt-on guidelines for the various different taxa, for example, um, how would we keep those up to date and on the same timeline with the guide if we took that kind of approach? That's a great question um, because these guidance documents are the, the property and, and the product of these professional organizations. Um, at least 
under the, the framework that we have in place right now, it's really up to them. Now, that said, the um, bird guidelines uh, revision just came out this year. The mammal guidelines, there is going to be a revision released almost certainly this year. Um, the fish guidelines are were revised at, I think, pretty close to the same timeline as the mammal guidelines. The herb guidelines are further out of date, um, but I have had communications with uh, individuals there. As far as putting them on a common framework, that would require articulation and cooperation between the professional societies and uh, the standing committee. And frankly, it would probably require also support mm -hmm. um, because this is a task that uh, at least the taxon societies have taken on pretty much on their own shoulders over the past um, decades, except for the first um, the first product, which was um, funded by NSF. So that is a, a question to be uh, decided and, and a solution to be sought. Um, and it really comes down to how these guidance documents, these guidelines are incorporated within the guide. Okay, excellent. So I think we're going to have some additional sessions coming up, specifically thinking about the format of the guide that I think will also incorporate um, what kind of structures and groups would be involved to achieve that goal of having more timely updates. Actually, Jenny, we yep. have one more question yep. for um, Kate, if she's still on the line. Do you want me to ask? I am. Him? Yep, I'm here. You here? Okay. Yep. Um, Hi, Kate. Uh, we had a question for you. How many of the survey respondents work with non-traditional animals such as wildlife and wild fish? That I don't think was data we gathered. So I'm not really sure that I can give that answer. We only asked if you were a veterinarian. So we did not get into the into the details of what species you should work with. Hi, um, I just wanted to add that during the workshop committee discussions, I noticed some of the non-traditional or non-typical species, and also that includes the um, client-owned or companion animal work that may or may not have been mentioned in some of the information provided thus far. And so knowing um, that that is sometimes seen as a niche or specialty area and is just not as represented, like the, the comments um, in the surveys and respondents just show what the guide speaks to and what is not spoken to will just not generate as much response. And so I um, paid attention to those because those are of interest to me professionally and personally. And so as the workshop uh, happens today and tomorrow, I think that some of the questions raised, you might be uh, finessing and developing your questions further. So please keep an eye out for that. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. I think we have time for maybe another question. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Um, so we had another question raised around um, the topic of should. So we've heard some feedback that maybe that's one of the more difficult areas to navigate. Um, and maybe there's even a desire to move to may, must, and retire should. So I think a question came up of, um, do we have a sense if OLA will reconsider its requirement of should statements if the guide moves to clarify the definition or change its approach to should? Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't think we can speak for Ola, um, but we will hear be hearing from them later. So maybe a question we can raise back up at that point. Good. Any additional questions we want to raise at this oh, point? There's... Okay, then I can ask that. Okay. Um, here's a question. Will the collaborative model of IACUC researchers and SMEs or subject matter experts also address worker health and safety combined with resource efficiency and sustainability. Collaborators available in International Institute for Sustainable Laboratories. There. Uh, if the collaborative model of IACUC researchers and SMEs will address worker health and safety combined with resource efficiency and sustainability. So right now, my, and this is my opinion that I'm sharing, but I think that the Animal Care and Use Committee has inherited a lot of side responsibilities because it's one of the few committees that's required by regulation 
Um, the only safety committee that's required is the Institutional Biosafety Committee, and it's also very specific for the types of um, oversight that it provides. So all these other um, other all of these other areas are important to a research program. However, they are not assigned to any particular individual or committee at this point. So I think that over time, all of that has been assigned to the <clears throat> Animal Care News Committee. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, and it should be noted that um, the emerging um, emerging issues for the guide section will do a deeper dive into the occupational health topics um, and as well as some of the others that have been raised um, through the VicRaw survey in terms of areas that um, require evolution uh, in the next iteration of the guide. So I think with that, we'll probably take a break for lunch uh, and we're going to come back for 1235. So about 35 minutes for lunch and we'll see you at 1235 East Coast time. <laughs>